I want to uh, talk again about inflation. Um, I'm going to emphasize the fiscal policy part a little bit more. And I'm also going to emphasize a little more um, why do we disagree so much? <laughs> uh, where are the limits of our knowledge? And what are the sort of the different schools of thought uh, so that you can evaluate arguments uh, for yourself about uh, what we're doing and where we're going? I should say um, I, I am, in some sense, the luckiest guy on the planet. Uh, about uh, a year, year and a half ago, I sent in a, a manuscript to Princeton University Press <coughs> of a tome on inflation and, and how fiscal policy affects inflation. The original, and there's the picture, I'm plugging the book. Uh, the introduction said, well, we haven't seen inflation in about 40 years and nobody seems to care about it, but maybe someday you know, we'll have some inflation to take this book off the shelf. Uh, let's just say I, I got a chance to rewrite the introduction. So uh, as a reminder, here, here we are, um, and I've plotted here uh, uh, the, uh, boy, it's, how do I point? I don't point. Uh, uh, there's the inflation that we're seeing right now, um, and uh, as we came out of the recession, it, there's this typical pattern, inflation dips uh, in a recession, uh, as you know, and then uh, picks up a little bit, and things were perfectly normal, and, uh, except that the uh, pointer doesn't work anymore, so you're, we're not gonna have to give up on that completely. Uh, things are perfectly normal until um, uh, uh, January 2021. It's common, inflation goes down and then comes back to about 2%, and everything looked normal, and then boom, right around January 2021, uh, inflation uh, took off up to 9%, uh, where it is uh, roughly now. Uh, as John emphasized a little more politely than I might, uh, the interest rate is the blue line, that's what the Federal Reserve does, and the Federal Reserve did absolutely nothing until last March <clears throat> when it finally woke up and started to do something. So uh, there's our situation. I think it is, oh, thank you, worth uh, two sessions on it because it's probably one of the most important economic issues of our time. Um, really, the most economic, important economic issue of our time is the slowdown of, of long-term growth, which has nothing to do with recessions and business cycles, but, but I, I'm here to talk about inflation. <laughs> <laughs> so we won't talk about that. We'll talk about inflation and, and, and what's doing. So what are our big questions? Where did this inflation come from? What happened in January 2021 uh, or, or nearly before that that got inflation going? What's the shock? I'll emphasize the fiscal end of that too. Um, next question, I think the essence of John's talk, is the Fed's slow response making inflation worse? Uh, does spending a year doing nothing, does that of itself make what make the inflation, um, does that push the inflation up even more than whatever the initial shock was that sent it off? Third, of course, where are we going to go in the future? What kind of policies will it take to stop this inflation? And my general outlook uh, will be uh, things are a lot less uh, certain than most people, and especially politicians and central bankers. I will admit about it, and I'll, I'll show you some of the difference of the opinion, and I'll also focus uh, on, on what I think is, you know, my, I, I'm, of course, I have my opinions on this, <laughs> which emphasize the integration of fiscal and monetary policy. It is not up to the Fed all by itself. Uh, the Fed has a big influence on, uh, on inflation, but doesn't uh, uh, single-handedly take care of it. Okay, so a little bit of background, uh, just, uh, there is a tendency in, among economists to speak in gibberish, and that tendency is even worse among central bankers to speak in some sort of word salad. Uh, a lot of that is deliberate obfuscation. When they say we plan to inject liquidity into the economy, what they mean is we're, we plan to print money and hand it out by, by, by helicopters, but they don't want to say that because people would be too clear and transparent what they're up to. Uh, so just as a little bit of background, uh, what is inflation anyway? Uh, inflation is, the, 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 we start with the consumer price index. And what that is, it's, it's, it's actually as well measured as we can. It's, there's difficulties, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics goes out and tries to calculate, let's take a basket of goods that the typical person might have bought and see what it costs to buy that same basket of goods, a little bit of everything, uh, this year as opposed to what it costs to buy that basket of goods last year. That is the consumer price index, and it starts with a level. So if you can see the, the, uh, the left-hand uh, the, the chart, you know, it's at 300 and what's it at? About 320. 
What that means is that a basket of goods that cost $100 in 1982 now costs $320. And you can see there has been a steady, slow inflation over time. $320 versus $100 when I was in grad school, uh, that's a big, big overall change in the price level. So that's the price level, and inflation is the rate of change in the price level. And you can see why we start arguing, because of course, here's, here's our inflation, the, very, uh, the recent fast rise in the price level, but you take a month-to-month -month change, a year-to-year -year change, what about this, what about that? It's easier to argue about. Uh, the, than the price level itself. And you can see in the 1960s, the price level is quite constant. We used to go centuries with the price level about constant. Uh, somehow the Fed reinterpreted price stability in its mandate to mean 2% inflation forever. I don't know why 2% is a good number rather than zero, but you can see the 2% is the steady rise uh, in that thing. And then all of a sudden, an unsteady rise. And you can see the 1970s, a, a quicker rise. So that's what inflation is. Second, in the data. What is inflation the economic phenomenon? Here's where people get confused a lot. Inflation the economic phenomenon is the price of everything going up and wages going up. It is essentially, it is, the value of money going down. So the part of what we're seeing that is inflation, it's prices of everything going up and wages going up, not the price of one thing going up relative to other things. Those are relative price changes. Now, what we see in reality is, of course, a lot of both. Prices, you know, here's how prices are going. <laughs> uh, prices are going up relative to each other. Some are going up faster, some are going up slower. On top of that, everything's moving together. So the phenomenon of inflation is the everything moving together. It is the l decline in the value of currency. And that confusion is all over the place. <laughs> so a supply shock or an, an energy price shock. What is that? There's less, there's less oil to go around, or you can get less stuff through the ports. What does that mean? Well, that means oil has to go up relative to everything else. We don't have as much of it around. We got to drive less, and prices are the signal that we got to use less of something. So that's a relative price change, or the, the price of TVs has to go up because we can't get them through the ports, a supply shock. But that is, the price has to go up relative to wages. It doesn't say whether that goes up or whether maybe wages go down, or whether we all go up together. Inflation is how much everything is moving up and down together. So confusing inflation and relative price changes is one of the biggest problems out there. We're concern, I'm gonna concern, be concerned about inflation. To what extent, uh, uh, on top of that, is everything going up and down together? Okay, where did our inflation come from? I promise we'd answer that question. I'll give you one answer. Here's what our government did in the pandemic. For good or bad reasons, it printed up about $3 trillion of money and sent it as checks to voters. Uh, sorry, to uh, needy, uh, <laughs> to needy citizens. Uh, now that's not exact, I don't wanna get into the details of Federal Reserve accounting, but that's close enough to what it did. It borrowed $2 trillion more trillion and sent those as checks to, uh, to needy citizens and businesses and everybody else. Five trillion bucks is a lot of money. <laughs> total GDP is about 25 trillion. Uh, at the outset of this, total government debt was about 17 trillion, and now it's five trillion more than that. So printing up and borrowing that much money and giving it to people, duh, you get inflation. Uh, Milton Friedman once joked that uh, if you really want to cause inflation, it's very easy to do. Drop money from helicopters. It's a beautiful image and one worth thinking about. Uh, and it, it works gorgeously. That's what we did. Five trillion bucks from helicopters. I don't want to sound, this was not a dumb policy. We had a pandemic on. It was important uh, not to have every business in the country go bankrupt. It was important that people who were out of jobs shouldn't be uh, you know, starving in the streets. Uh, in my view, they overdid it. Um, we didn't need quite so much money spread around quite so, like so much um, fertilizer. Uh, but at the time, um, there's a lot of thought that debt and deficits doesn't matter, and, and so overdoing it was better than underdoing it. Anyway, we're not here about optimal pandemic policy and insurance, social insurance and so forth. Five trillion bucks went out. Uh, no surprise that um, it caused inflation. Uh, I graphed uh, here M2 that uh, John mentioned. That includes savings and checking accounts, and it went up a lot too. And that's a lot because of the mechanism. What happened was, uh, the, way, the way we don't drop money from helicopters, the Treasury writes checks. 
So the treasury sent people checks, those checks went into people's checking accounts and savings accounts, boom, there's the increase in the amount in people's checking and savings accounts. So that is a fact as well. Now, again, all of a sudden we're gonna have some debates. Was it really uh, the fiscal shock? Was it really the quantity of M2? John stressed the monetary stuff. I'm gonna be a little more suspicious about that. So it's certainly true that we dropped something from helicopters. <laughs> And I think that is uh, that rather than the supply shocks and so forth is, is clearly the source of the, the, the most important source of the inflation. Now, of course, we dropped the money from the helicopters because there was a pandemic. So in some greater sense, it was the pandemic that caused the inflation. But had we not responded to that by dropping the money from the helicopters, uh, we wouldn't have inflation. Now, there's two theories here. Uh, what I will call fiscal theory is that inflation ultimately comes when there is too much government debt overall relative to what people think the government can pay it back. People are very happy to hold a lot of government debt if they think the government will pay it back. The government, our government can borrow huge amounts of money as it did like in World War II, as long as people have confidence that that, that money will get paid back. So to generate inflation, this is why, as John mentioned, there isn't a strong correlation between debt and deficits and inflation. If you borrow money to buy a house, uh, that's a lot of debt. That's a lot of deficit. <laughs> but the bank and you both understand you've, you've got the wherewithal to pay it back. So the bank's happy to hold your debt. Uh, you, you are happy to get it and, and promise to pay it off. So the key to inflation is when there's debt that people don't think the government is capable or willing to pay back. And if we're going to, that, that's the crucial and hard to measure part of, of when, why a big debt like this, or why when you drop money from helicopters, you're sending a clear signal. Here's the money, spend it, because we're not gonna pay this back uh, by, by, by raising taxes in the future. The monetary theory also says, you know, inflation comes from too much money chasing too few goods. So they're both say, if you drop money from helicopters, you're gonna get inflation. Uh, now, how are they different? Um, the monetary theory says it depends whether it's money than debt. So let's ask, we both agree, drop stuff from, drop money from helicopters, you're gonna get inflation. But the question is, is it important that that stuff is money rather than all government debt? So let's think of a conceptual experiment. Suppose the government had dropped money from helicopters, but at the same time, uh, the Fed's thieves had come to your uh, house and uh, taken your treasure, an equal amount of treasury bills out of your safe or uh, taxed away your retirement account. So you get five, uh, $5,000 dropping in your backyard from a helicopter, hooray. You go back and look and they've taxed away uh, $5,000 from your retirement account. So you're no wealthier than they were before. Is that gonna make you go out and spend as much as just having the money from the helicopter? Well, the monetary theory says yes. It's the amount of money that matters, not the total amount of wealth. I think the total amount of wealth is what got people spending. If we had taken away five trillion of wealth, if there had been no deficit at the same time, uh, then, you, then you wouldn't have had inflation. Similarly, would it be enough to stop the inflation? What is it gonna take to stop the inflation? Uh, if you have the monetary theory, what matters is the amount of money, uh, not the total amount of wealth that you have. So it would be enough, all those M2, all those bank accounts, all we have to do is to uh, tell the average citizen, hello, you're the average citizen. Uh, I'm gonna take back $5 trillion out of your bank accounts, but I'm gonna give you all something in return. What I'm gonna give you is a mutual fund that has $5 trillion of treasury debt in it. Now, is that gonna make you feel poorer and stop spending? I don't know, do you care if you have a bank account versus a mutual fund that holds treasury debt, by the way, which pays interest, which your bank account doesn't right now, I might be a lot happier about that actually <laughs> than being stuck with a bank account that pays zero right now. So there's a big difference when you're thinking about money versus overall government debt. Are you thinking about the composition, that's a fancy word of government debt, or are you thinking about the total quantity? And I th when I think about people spending, it's about do they feel wealthier, not do they have too much money but too, too little in their, in their uh, mutual funds. So not so clear, uh, and I think there is a case that uh, the overall amount of debt. But now you know, what is it we're arguing about? Well, there's two theories you can think about it. Mm -hmm.